Hello everybody, my name is Luke Marr and this is Hot Mode and today on Hot Mode we're coming to you with your late, better late than never, November 2023 fashion roast and review. We're going to talk about all the looks from November that we got to get into and there are some really important ones. We got to highlight Hunter Schaefer, Rachel Zegler for The Hunger Games. There was the GQ Man of the Year awards. We had Beyonce showing up for Renaissance. We got stuff to discuss. We got people, places, things to talk about. Without further ado, let's get into it. Now, first up, we have Anita, who is wearing the young up-and-coming designer Grace Ling. Grace is based out of New York, and she does a lot of really intriguing hardware and metalware work, which I kind of love. Pretty simple. It's pretty much a black bandeau and a black floor-length skirt, but the piece of interest that really makes one say, oh, Grace Ling, who is that? Is this rose that's done in some sort of metal. I don't know if it's plated. I don't know if it's fully one one piece of steel, maybe silver, maybe gold, something along those lines. I would assume it's some sort of plate situation just because it's part of the actual clothing rather than a standalone jewelry piece. It's intriguing to see that that is sort of the central and integral part of the skirt that is meant to sort of be the jazzy, wow, pizzazzy experience. Now the collection that Grace Ling did actually was based on this idea of Neverland and Wendy from Neverland, but also sort of brought in different sculptural elements, which is why you see not only the rose, but also the bag that Anita is wearing, which is also by Grace Ling. And it's a Minotier bag, which is in the shape of a booty. A little booty. I love it. I think it's fun. I think it's cool. I think it's chic. I like when young designers are actually building up little repertoires of their work, sort of doing things that stand out much more. And she was also inspired by a lot of sculpture, specifically artists like Brancusi. And so I like the fact that there is this hardware metal element being brought in, but it kind of differs from a lot of what we're seeing recently in fashion. I feel like you think about Loewe, Gareth Pugh, realm of designers that are doing metal work as standalone pieces. But I like the fact that Grace is incorporating these metal pieces into the look rather than just having them be the standalone feature and the wow editorial, but rather there's something you actually buy and wear if you so choose. So shout out to Anita for supporting a young designer. We love that. We got to talk about Beyonce in Versace. She's wearing an Oraton silver dress, which I feel like everybody might say, oh, well, everybody kind of wears those, whatever. But the thing about Beyonce's is the fit of it is insane. It's crazy. I will say that for the most part, I think they usually fit pretty well. Usually when they're done, they make sense. But if you look at her waist, it's crazy that they can actually manipulate that material to fit her like that. And also, if you haven't watched our Beyonce video on Renaissance, you should go watch it. But there's just this whole element of the way that she gets people to fit things to her body which is amazing and also shockingly very uncommon within the world of celebrities. Shocker. It's almost like celebrities are allergic to tailors, but at the same time, I know that they are not because I know that tailors are usually happening around when it comes to celebrity outfits. So it's a weird thing that I don't really understand, but Beyonce's silver look, it's beautiful. I love the shape of the breast cup, the fact that they dip in and then they sort of flare up right at the tippity top. The way that it hits at the hip is, it's crazy, it's beautiful, it's stunning. Like this is why this fabric was made. It's stunning, it's beautiful, it's effortless, it's easy, and at the same time, so incredibly complex, which I think is what is so great about Beyonce is that she makes things look so, so easy. And yet at the same time, they are so incredibly goddamn complex. It doesn't even, makes sense. Doesn't make logical sense. This is a channel member exclusive because I want to talk about this, but I haven't talked about it anywhere, but it's something that's been on my mind. So possibly. Next up, we have Blake Lively, who I believe is attending the Renaissance tour premiere as well. And she wearing a black tweed skirt. It's a mini skirt. It's boucle. We can see that. But then she's wearing some sort of like crepe matte black blazer with a silver embroidery that sort of crackles along the bottom to a degree. Maybe she's trying to mix and match. I don't know. I don't really get it. Doesn't really make sense to me. It's just kind of blah. Nobody could really take the shine away from Beyonce, so it's, it's a tough ask anyway, but it also just feels a little bit Eh. She's trying to reference, but it's not its not really hidden. Next up, we have Boy Genius. So let's talk about all three members because they're all wearing Tom Brown. So let's start with Phoebe Bridgers because she is on the far left. She is wearing a Tom Brown black corset. It seems to be a velvet of some sort and then a floor length black skirt by Tom Brown. And it seems that again, as per usual with Tom Brown's work, the lining is showing some sort of seersucker. Maybe it's not seersucker. Maybe it's just actually stripes that Tom Brown usually does. It's okay. I don't hate it. I don't love it. I think Phoebe is usually a Tom Brown woman to a degree. She, she usually works with them. It's not really great. 
It's just kind of there. It's just kind of happening. Now, in the middle, we have Julian Baker, who is also wearing Tom Brown. Now, this, this I like. This I kind of love. It's a colorless Tom Brown shirt, or at least it looks like it's a colorless Tom Brown shirt. And it seems to be, maybe it's actually just a jacket. I'm really not sure. But it's full trompe l'oeil. I'm pretty positive. Because we can tell it's trompe l'oeil because if you look at the neck, the bow tie that's supposed to be there that you normally would think, oh, it's a bow tie, is actually coming apart because it's part of the button of the placket of the shirt. I love it. Pretty positive that it's actually all one piece too, because as we can see, it's colorless and it seems to fall straight into the rest of this knit cardigan, which Tom Brown, it's part of his style. He does wear vests, but also a lot of the time you will see Tom in actual cardigans too underneath blazers. I think that's why you're getting this motif of the knit and the buttons that's coming through in this beige. And then on the outer panels is where you're coming in with the black suit. I love it. I think it's fun. I think it's cool. I think it's a great way to reference Tom's work, but at the same time, it's a little bit surrealist, a little bit out there, a little bit kooky, a little bit crazy. I love the pant. I think it's a great fit. I think it works. That's just the way that Tom's pants fit. So you can be mad about it, but like it's not going to change. And I like the shoes. I think they work. As for Lucy Dacus, who's on the far right, she's wearing a white corset, and it seems that she's also wearing some sort of little sort of balloon-ish sleeves that are in full black silk satin, and that silk does line up with the stripe on the side of the dress pant that she's wearing, and that sort of casual Tom Brown little loafer brogue, pointed heel, mule situation. I don't love Lucy's look as much. I do think the sleeves look a little wrinkled when I look at them up close, but I like the fact that they do actually play into the side stripe on the trouser. I think that's cool. I think that's fun. I think that's intriguing. Overall, one out of three, I think I'll take it. Next up, we have Bryn Whitfield, who is one of the Real Housewives of New York. And normally I don't talk about Real Housewives, but I really like this Bryn Whitfield look, so I'm gonna do it. It's a strapless white mermaid gown, and like, it's drama. It is drama, it is silhouette, it is all about that, and it's great. It's fantastic. The way that that mermaid skirt flares, the way that it really just hits right at the knee and then pops out is stunning. And you know what? She's carrying the dress. It's a beautiful silhouette on her. It looks amazing. And then that white is sort of covered from right under the bust area down to around the knee area in black sequins, or at least I think it's black paillettes because I think they look a little bit too big to be sequins, which I think is cool. I think that it almost looks like a, a venom of some sort. You know what I mean? I'm referencing like the Spider-Man villain where the venom element sort of like wraps over different parts of the body and sort of takes over. I also just love the fact that you have little black feathers that sort of continue that idea of like the splatter and the veininess of it and it falls down on the mermaid skirt as well. Like I, I love it. I think it's cool. I think it's simple. I think it's really easy in all those regards but at the same time it's bomb. It's great. It works. It, it pops. It's memorable. And I think so rare does it seem that celebrities know how to do that. So shout out to Brent. Next up we have Dua Lipa who is promoting her new song, Houdini. And so she's she showed up in quite a few looks to different events. But the one that I want to talk about is this Margiela look. It seems like Margiela's back. You know what I mean? People are, they're pushing. They want Margiela back. John Galliano designed. Everybody went to the most recent Margiela collection and people were in awe. They said it was one of the best shows of the season. But at the same time, I think Margiela has to push past the John Galliano stigma. So it's an intriguing element in terms of the bounce back. But at the same time, the tabby, which Julie Lipa here is wearing, she's wearing a Mary Jane high heel version of the tabby in black leather. It's been a really sort of star hero product for the brand in recent years. I think probably at least since 2018, 2019, it's been something that's constantly cropped up in popular mainstream fashion culture. It's very much so debated. It's very much so loved, hated, all of the above. I do genuinely think that it's really interesting because John Galliano adapted the tabby to be for men's in terms of leather boots and things like that as well on the runway. There's a lot there. And I, I like the fact that Dew is wearing it. I think that it proves that it can tap into not only mainstream fashion culture, but mainstream pop culture as well. And I think she sells you on it. I love a tabby. I think they're great shoes. I think they're wonderful. I think they're super cool. They have a great history to them. They're a Margiela staple. So it's interesting to see paired with this white sock. I think it plays into that Mary Jane sort of effect. As for the black dress underneath, I think that's probably also Margiela. It's wrinkled. It's some sort of slip dress. That feels very Margiela to me, but we can't really see it. The coat though, love that coat. Need that coat. The one thing I'm going to say is I understand people not liking John Galliano. I get it. I'm with you in that regard. Really bad. Really awful. The one thing I will say is like, unlike most 
lead all other designers. He makes really good product and he understands how to adapt himself to a brand. And like, that's a good coat. Yeah, this black jacquard coat with beautiful florals running through it, it's partially oversized. Doesn't look like it's undone or deconstructed or reconstructed whatsoever, which I think is interesting considering that's kind of very Margiela-isms. It's a beautiful jacket. It's a lovely coat. And I think that the fact she's wearing it, I appreciate. I think it pushes Dua a little bit outside of what we normally consider her to be, which is a little bit more slinky, a little bit more sort of sexy, a little bit more pop girly. I think this is a little bit out of that usual universe that she exists in. So I appreciate the look overall. Next up we have Elizabeth Debicki. Now she is wearing Bottega Veneta and this is for the premiere of The Crown. The sixth season came out. I don't know about you guys. I love the first four episodes. The Diana Ghost. Weird. I did not understand if this is supposed to be like a historically semi-accurate show. Unless the queen was telling me that Diana appeared to her as a ghost to sit down and have a chat and cup of tea, which I don't think happened, I'm a little bit upset. Just saying. But do I like that Elizabeth Debicki is referencing one of the most iconic dresses to have ever existed, the revenge dress that Princess Diana wore? Yeah, of course. Iconic. We love it. This one's a little bit different because Diana's obviously was fully sort of both off the shoulder, but I like the fact that she's working with Bottega to actually go for a dress that fits in with that aesthetic. You have a similar vibe of one of the straps sort of falls off the shoulder, but the other one stays on top. It creates an intriguing little dichotomy. It's not too, too crazy. I do wish that the jewelry was there, cosplay a little bit, because that's what we're doing. I feel like maybe Elizabeth Debicki is trying to not necessarily do like Diana cosplay, because I, I do find that when like Kate or Megan were doing like Diana cosplay, it was weird. But I think Elizabeth Debicki, it makes sense why she would be doing it. I do think playing on a little bit of the big jewel, the big rock that sat on Diana's neck when it came to the revenge dress would make sense. But at the same time, I think that the black dress on somebody that looks like Elizabeth Debicki, who looks like Princess Diana, I get it. I understand it. It's not too crazy, but at the same time, good reference, very content with that. Next up, we have Emma Chamberlain, who is wearing Acne Studios. Emma said, hot pant trend? Yes. Sold. I'm going to do it in leather. I like her little leather brief. I like the stocking. I think it's fun. I think it's cute. I feel like a lot of time you only seem like Hailey Bieber, Kendall Jenner in it. So I think it's smart for Emma to like go into doing a little bit of this like hot it girl, you know, ITGIRL fashion moments. I like the leather jacket. I like that it's collarless. I like the fact that it's crinkly and wrinkly. I love the sunglasses with it. I even like the hair. I just feel like it has a cool moto girly look. So I'm into it. I think it's pretty chill, pretty like not too avant, but at the same time, I think that it certainly is memorable and a little bit outlandish. It's like if Goldilocks was wearing Acne Studios. It's just right. Now next up is this little Hunter Schaefer tribute. Now I feel like going forward, if there's ever anybody that like puts in the work, does a little bit of a moment during the month for a bunch of their looks that they're doing appearances for, I want to highlight it. And so we're going to talk about a few of the Hunter Schaefer looks here, both for the channel members and the non-channel members. So if you're a non-channel member, you're still getting a little bit of a bing, bang, boom talking about it. Hunter Schaefer did play the character Tigress in the new Hunger Games film, which is called A Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes. I have not seen it, but I do know that in the film, Hunter Schaefer plays Tigress, who is a stylist for the Capitol, maybe not at that point in the film or in the timeline of the multiverse of Hunger Games or whatever. I know that eventually she goes on to become a stylist for some of the tributes. And in reality, we all know that the people of the Capitol, if you ever watched any of the Hunger Games movies or read the books, they got outlandish looks, you know what I mean? They got avant-garde, they got crazy, they got over the top, they have looks, they have aesthetics, they have all this craziness that they put into their outfits because they can. And it's meant to sort of show the wealth disparity between the capital and the rest of the districts. Layered nuance thing looks a little bit at luxury fashion and haute couture and things like that and shows the fact that people can be living all these lavish lives and then other people are literally starving. And it's bad. And it's a good, valid sort of thing to acknowledge and look at and say, yes, 100%, we could see it. But the thing also is, if you're going to play the character that is one of the people that is a tastemaker in that world, you should, in fact, have taste. And now the great thing about Hunter Schaefer is this first look we'll talk about, which is a Scaparelli painted dress. Now, Hunter's dress is from the fall 2023 Haute Couture collection. I think that this is kind of a perfect example of Scaparelli by Daniel Roseberry. He wields in a little bit of Elsa's work and references to the time period at which she worked, which in the 1930s, she worked a lot with the surrealist artists who were painters. I mean, Magritte, Dolly, all those guys and gals worked with 
in the medium and form of painting. And so I love the fact that this is a crochet dress. And if we zoom in, we can see that each of these little pieces that look like a painting and actually create the motif of a body with a bust and a belly button and thighs is actually made up of individual pieces that have been painted on and then applique on top of this crochet. And it goes straight up to the neck, creates a little mock neck detail. It moves itself down to a sort of sleeve angle. And the sleeves do actually seem to be longer than the actual arms, which I also love. Then it hits around the knee and then is pretty simple, not really super duper crazy long, lengthy, and all that jazz which I think the restraint is kind of smart. But I think the idea of dressing like the people within the capital who have these avant-garde, outlandish, and luxurious items is kind of smart. It's method dressing. That's what she's trying to portray. I think more and more people are understanding that if you are an actor or an actress and you have a part that you're trying to promote, I've only really recently realized how important the actual marketing of a film is to the way that the film is then shown, at least the reception of the film. You have to sell it to people. You have to make people interested. You have to make people say, oh, I didn't realize that was coming out. This is one of those ways to do that. This is a crazy look. It's super out there. It's super strange. It's super weird. I know a lot of people didn't like the hair and the makeup, but I think in a weird way, this idea of the hair and the makeup also is playing into the outlandish looks that the people of the capital also wear. I very distinctly remember all of the Greek named stylists for Katniss Everdeen, whether they were the people creating clothing or the people that were doing her hair or her makeup or her beauty regime, all looked crazy. They had insane colored hair. They had makeup that was quite intriguing. I mean, this makeup to me gives Effie Trinket very powdered white. Get into the beauty history of why people want to look so pale and it's because you want to essentially prove that you don't go outside at all because you don't have to do any manual labor. So if you're tanned, it's seen as this idea of manual labor. You are a worker, all those sorts of things. But if you're pale, that means you're sitting inside all day. You're not really doing much. Probably what Hunter is going for here with the makeup. I love it. I really think it's so cool. I think it's such a brilliant style. And I think that with the Scaparelli Haute Couture Collection, it could easily get lost in terms of a bunch of other things and a bunch of other styles because there's so much to look at. But I think Hunter has done a really great job here of bringing that to the forefront of our mind and getting to show off a look that might not always get the appreciation it probably deserves. Next, we saw Hunter in a custom Prada look, and it's actually based on the spring 2009 Prada collection. Hunter's look essentially is a gold foiled or metallic fabric that is a high-waisted floor-length trumpet skirt with a little bit of a side apron-y peplum that sort of creates a little bit of shape at the hips, and then a crop top with a halter neck and also like a stole built in that creates a shawl sort of detail, but it's short sleeved. It's really crazy. It's really wild, but it's also based again on an old Prada collection. Hunter is a Prada ambassador, pretty positive she is. And so I love the idea of her referencing old cool Prada. I think it's chic. Mrs. Prada likes to reference herself. So I think she's doing a smart sort of look and take on that. On top of it, I've talked about this collection numerous times since Prada has essentially redone it, I think a season or two ago. But this spring 2009 collection, the reason that there's a lot of wrinkles and crinkling and things like that is because Mutual Prada comes from a bourgeois family. She comes from a wealthy sort of aristocratic family within the world of Milan. And so historically, she's looked at bourgeois dress and the way that wealthy women dress played on it. And so wrinkling your clothes on purpose would be seen as so like tacky and terrible in the bourgeois world. But Mutual Prada is like, actually, it's incredibly chic to wrinkle your clothing because that's pretty normal. And so can I get away with pushing that? And can I get away with remixing that? And then will people buy into that? Like, how does it all work? And and that's the great thing about Mutual Prada. And so I love the fact that Hunter is looking at the references here. And I think it shows a sort of nod to one of the great designers, I would say the 21st and 20th century. And I just feel like that idea of looking at bourgeois also reflects, again, the capital, the aristocracy, the idea of this sort of way of living and working that is so out of the realm and depth of most other people. Now, the last look we'll talk about for the non-channel members is this Marnie look. I love it. Listen, I will say that Francesco Rizzo was accused of copying this design from a designer. SLX World, which is a young brand based in London, did, in my personal opinion, invent this. And I'm very, 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 very strict about what I think is actually people copying, big designers copying from small designers. I think that there are examples where people just don't really understand that they actually didn't do something first. I'm pretty positive that SLX World did actually create these cut out sticker flower decals and appliques and actually do it 
first. There's just something about it that I think is cool. I like the idea of the wired metallic pieces sort of popping off of the dress. And underneath, again, you have the decals that look like little stickers made into a dress, collaged into a dress. But at the same time, I can still recognize that SLX World is a designer that kind of did it first. I know that there are looks from about a year ago that Marnie did do, and it looks similar, but it's not really the same. But like SLX World, if you go back into the archives, like you could, you can see that they did it first. That's my thing. Love the look. I love the idea, but I also love the fact that SLX World did it first. All in all, I just want to say, I do really love what Hunter has done here. And I want to shout out her stylist, Dara. Dara is an editor at Interview. She's a fashion director. Dara and Hunter came together and said, we are fashion girls. We're going to fashion girl it. And they did an amazing job. Hire cool young stylists and editors and things like that to work with you because in reality, they're actually really good and they want it and they care and they put together amazing things and they actually get what the cultural zeitgeist is. If you just keep working with the same people, we're really boring and don't actually like do a lot you usually look really boring and uninteresting. So please stop working with them and work with cool young people like Dara. Thank you. Next up, we have Jacob Alordi and he is wearing Burberry. Now it's this three-piece brown suit and it's for the premiere of Saltburn, which is the film that is about, I believe, one of like the upper crust British universities that the aristocracy go to. It's very shishi private, yada, yada, yada. And Jacob Alordi sort of like gets in with one of these people and they become best buddies. And so I think that's probably why Jacob is wearing this pinstripe brown suit. And it's a three-piece suit. The jacket, double-breasted, great. Love the vest, love the waistcoat. I think it's very chic. The white button-down shirt with the black tie and then the matching pant and the black patent leather shoes. Honestly, it looks very British. It looks very boring, looks very banal, looks very uninteresting. And also at the same time, Burberry is a brand that historically has been a brand that people have bought and it's meant to sort of signify British luxury, the raincoat, all those sorts of things. And so I think it kind of makes sense that that's what he's going for here. I know that it maybe doesn't seem like it's method dressing, but to me, this is actually, in fact, very much so method dressing. I think that he looks exactly like a British boy from Eton or Harrow or any of those kind of schools going to Cambridge or Oxford or Imperial, things like that. Those sort of schools way back when, or maybe even now, just kind of the vibes. It has that Bullingdon Club kind of aesthetic kind of feeling to it, that good old British sensibility of dapper dressing and Savile Row and all those sorts of things. I just think it's smart. Also, I think the suit is cool. Again, like the black and the brown, I don't really love it, but I do understand and I think it makes sense in terms of the look. So I get it. I appreciate it. Another great look from the Renaissance premiere was Kelly Rowland in Jean-Paul Gaultier by Julien Dossena. Now, this is from the Haute Couture collection that Julien Dossena did. Now, Julien Dossena is the designer of Rabanne, and so he did a collaboration collection with Jean-Paul Gaultier because that's what they do every season. They have a different designer. And so it's this ruched dress with, you know, seams and darts running through it. It has the two conical bra pieces, which is an iconic Gaultier silhouette and piece, and then two little sort of ruffles at the bottom. It's in this full silver style, which Beyonce very much so has been into silver for Renaissance. And so I think Kelly killed it. I think it fits her beautifully. I think the length is great. I think that it's the right amount of Gautier-isms, but at the same time, it still fits in with the whole Beyonce aesthetic. I think she looks lovely in it. And I think with a dress like this, that can be kind of tough because there's a lot going on. There's a lot happening. It's the silver is a lot. The ruching is a lot. The conical bra shape is a lot. But Kelly is wearing this like somebody would wear a pretty simple, easy, minimal, monochrome dress. She is wearing this like, yeah, I look hot, I look sexy, and at the same time, I look iconic, I understand Gautier, and I'm serving it to the girls. And I live. Next up, we have Kim Kardashian wearing Balenciaga. I know people don't want me to talk about Balenciaga, so like, skip it if you need to, but she's essentially wearing this oh, I really hate, hate the cat suit, like that really light beige cat suit that like really does not look like Kim's skin tone. Not good. Then she's wearing essentially a sheer black inflated and exaggerated floral lace dress over top. It's like a pantashoe cat suit situation. I just wish there were gloves attached to it, to be completely honest. I just think that would like bring it all together somewhat. I just, I don't get it. I understand the black lace. I understand black, the color Balenciaga. Like that I get. I'm not daft. I'm not dumb. But I just don't really understand the Balenciaga mentality right now. I just, they're acting like nothing happened, which that makes sense for a brand to do. 
my thing is the clothing doesn't reflect that they're acting like nothing happened. And that's where I'm losing it. Like if we're going to act like nothing happened, give me crazy, over the top, avant-garde, ridiculous, being weird and ironic and unironic. Like do that. Just do it. Like at least do it. But I don't understand the like playing it safe now and being like, oh, everything's fine. I just I don't get it. I don't understand it. And then on top of it, it just keeps giving these like very uninteresting, unmemorable, blah, blah, boring looks. And so I just feel like Demna is caught in the middle for a bunch of reasons. And it just isn't going anywhere or doing anything. And yeah, I just don't really understand. Then what is the point? Next up, we have Kylie Jenner, who is wearing Ferragamo. Now, this is a intriguing look. It's something that we've talked about a little bit, but it's this patent leather bodice with a cutout and then a brown silky skirt that flows down. Again, my thing with this look is I like the idea of it. I think it's cool. I think it's fun. I think it brings in the history of leather and leather goods and leather footwear to a look and the history of Ferragamo as a brand. But I think that it needs a little bit of R&D. It needs a little research and development because the way that it crinkles, whether that's from the fabric, whether that's from the fit, the fabric underneath the patent leather, whether that's from the fit of it just in general, it just needs to be a little bit more refined. I just think that maybe if it was a really static piece of leather, like those molded pieces, it would go over a lot better. I think that it wouldn't have the the crinkling and the wrinkling in it, which I think just takes you out of like the fantasy of it. And I know that the cutouts are very much so Maximilian Davis for Ferragamo. And I love the cutouts. I think they're great. I like them in the bags. I like them in the shoes. I like them all over. I just think that, again, it needs to be fine-tuned. But I like that still Ferragamo by Max. It's pretty, I don't want to say minimal, but like it's very chic and it's really unassuming and it's not super avant-garde and in-your-face and annoying and then also done badly. Rather, it's really beautiful, well-made clothes. And I think you talk to anybody in fashion, they would say that Ferragamo makes nice stuff. Like you go to that collection every season and you look at it and you say, I get why he's here. Or like he makes nice clothes. He makes clothes that you say, oh, there isn't a look that is out of place. Like that shouldn't be there. And that normally happens at almost every fashion show. So it's rare to see a designer do that. And I think that this is a great example of, I just need it to be refined, need it to be fine tuned. Because once it's fine tuned, can't be touched. Next up, we have Margot Robbie, who is wearing Scaparelli. She's been wearing quite a bit of Scaparelli and she wore a lot of it when she was doing the promo for Barbie. But I like this sheer brown, silky corset situation, but also the fact that it has a pair of wide leg, very, very, very baggy, over-exaggerated pants that are also partially undone and like that's part of the design is the fact that they look like they're unbuttoned and that they're folded over, but at the same time, like they're actually not, or maybe it's a skirt. It looks like pants to me, but I also love the fact that it seems to be in some sort of velvet. Like that's why it has that shine. It has a reflectiveness to it. Maybe it's treated. I don't know, but I like the idea. I think it's different for Margot. I think it's kind of chic. I think it's elegant. Again, the bodice is beautiful on her. Yeah, this is what we've been needing for quite some time. And so I'm happy that we're getting it. Next up, we have Megan the Stallion who is wearing Sally Balta. I'm intrigued by the look. I think that it's very Megan. It's sheer. It's kind of body conscious. It's fitted. But I feel like at the same time, it's trying to be a little bit more chic, a little bit more glamorous. But at the same time, I do think that there's a little bit of intrigue and interest to it, which to me takes it out of exclusively being like a sexy, sexy dress. Now, the thing is, it seems to be entirely piped in black lace, which I think is intriguing. And that black lace does have seemingly crystals in both black and red that sit around it as well. But the thing is, when you get to around the left waist area, you can see that black lace isn't just trimming, but becomes a sort of center piece where all of these brown sheer pieces of fabric connect. Out of it pours these sort of droplets of black, but also there's red that's built into the black embellishment and the black lace, which I also think is really intriguing. So I'm wondering if this maybe has something to do with the way that like blood over time, I think because it loses oxygen turns black. I'm wondering if that's what it is and these droplets are meant to look like blood drops and all that sort of stuff. Most definitely probably a reference to like an Eddie Slaman at Your Ohm and also like a Moa Lola who then redid it as well where the embellished blood dripping sort of styles exist if that is what this is trying to do. But I just thought it was an intriguing take for Megan on doing something that 
she normally does, but it feels like she's also trying to give it a little bit more depth, a little bit more layer. And I appreciate that. Next up, we have Rachel Zegler, who was also pairing and showing off her looks for The Hunger Games, this ballad of songbirds and the snakes. Here she is wearing an Alexander McQueen dress. Another thing is I love that she wore the dress. And when I did a little tiny video about the premiere that she wore this too, I was like, oh, it looks so great. It fits her so good. I understand where people in the comments were like, actually, it doesn't. I think the black is beautiful. I love the dip right above the bust line. I love the orchid coming in and making itself known in that beautiful red, bracing us for this gorgeous sort of deep, dark, bloody experience. And I feel like maybe that's kind of what the reference was here, bringing a little gothicness, a little emotion, a little macabre. That is very Alexander McQueen. But I think from like the hip to where the mermaid skirt element starts, it's very crinkled and wrinkled and it's hard not to notice it. That's my issue with it. I love the dress. I appreciate that she wore it. It's just, there's some fine tuning in terms of the movement there that needs to be adjusted. Next up, we have Taylor Swift wearing Balmain. And here's the thing. It's the silver dress. She wore it to the Renaissance premiere. So like, I appreciate that she went for it. She went silver. That was the vibe. I think Kelly Rowland is a great example of like, you could wear that silver and it could really like stand out and pop and really be something memorable. And Taylor Swift is like, how can I do the exact opposite of that? How can I be so unmemorable? I don't get it. I don't like dislike Taylor Swift as a person consistently. It's so blah. And also like that dress doesn't even look like it fits that well. And that's my issue. It's just like, what are you paying the stylist to do? That's my question. Because I'm sure he's on retainer. I'm sure he's getting paid well. But like, is he working? Because I know he's working. But, like, is he like doing the stuff? Is he doing anything? Is he thinking a little more in depth about the fashion? Besides, oh, silver, crystals, Balmain. You know, I could do that. And I could probably do that in probably like 15. Hi, we want to dress for Taylor Swift. Doesn't really matter if it fits well or not, or if it's actually interesting. I know that if I had that title as Taylor Swift stylist, they'd say, okay. And then they'd send the dress. I'd say, okay. And life would be good. So I guess that's what he's doing. But like, I just feel like maybe if you're paying him a lot of money, he should do a little bit more than that. Next up, we have Tilda Swinton, who is wearing Jean-Paul Gaultier, and this is by Hayter Ackerman. It's this big, bold, white silk coat. I love the lapels. It's ridiculous. It's pompous. It's over the top. It's ethereal. It's minimal. It's crazy. And it's Tilda Swinton, and I love her, and I think she's great. It's just a weird, wacky, wonderful moment. She's my avant-garde queen, and at the same time, like... It just looks chic and strange and weird and wacky. And I know people are going to be like, how would you think that? But it's like, you couldn't pull it off then, obviously. The girls that get it, get it. And the girls that don't, don't. And I am a girl that gets it. I love it. I want to live in Tilda Swinton's brain. Like, I just want to be there all the time. Because she's like, wow, I look so good. And I'm like, yeah, Tilda, you do. But then we have this other Tilda look. And... Chanel haute couture, double-breasted black tweed blazer, and that big, baggy, beautiful boucle pant sold. Like, very rarely do I say, oh my god, Chanel haute couture looks good. This is the moment that I say that. Because, like, it's just a beautiful jacket. It's a beautiful, lovely, gorgeous, clean, crisp line experience. I think this is the prowess of Chanel haute couture. It fits to your body. And I feel like there are very few celebrities that get the Chanel haute couture treatment like that. Till there's one. And it's because she deserves, because she's a fashion girl, and they get it. And finally, we have Viola Davis, who was wearing Oscar de la Renta. Listen, I love the cape dress with the slit. I think that's fun. I think it's cute. I like the gathering and the little bateau neckline. The stocking. I maybe wish we had done a glove that matched the stocking. I think that really would have pulled it all together. Or some sort of gradient stocking, because now that's a thing. It happens. It has been done. So I would have loved like a green into black gradient stocking here or a different shoe, something. Cause like, I love the green. I think the green's great. I think it's lovely. I just, if we're gonna do the stocking, that's great. I'm into it. I just need like the full, st I need full body stocking and a different shoe. But yeah, I need the shoe to change, but I love the green dress. Very cute. So let's talk about best and worst. Best, Beyonce and the Versace was very, 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 very good. Bryn Whitfield, I'm putting in my best dress. I'm going to put, oh, Kelly Rowland in the Jean-Paul Gaultier. That was hot. Hunter Schaefer and Scaparelli, and also Prada. Siza, Tilda. Oh, and Victoria Monet in the Theophilia. That was hot. That gagged me a bit. As for worst, tough, but not that tough. Hailey Bieber was just kind of boring. Taylor Swift, Bowman was not great. 
Horace Vaughn of the Proud, I didn't really love either. Like Lively and Chanel. Yeah, I think that's good. Please let me know what you guys thought in the comments down below. I'd love to hear all your thoughts and opinions. I will see you guys in the next video and TTYO. Oh.